We all know people who have a favorite breed of dog. People who are so devoted to one breed that it's the only type of dog they'll ever own. Maybe as you're listening to this, you're thinking, yes, I love golden retrievers and would never own any dog other than a golden retriever. That's not a bad thing. After all, different breeds of dogs possess different personality traits that make some more suitable for some families and less so for others. But here's a question I'd like to pose to you. Do you know what went into making each breed what it is today? The development of individual dog breeds has been anything but a natural progression. In fact, it's been essentially a large-scale human-directed genetic experiment. Just to give you a little history, scientists agree that all modern dogs are descendants of wolves. Even my parents' little 15-pound white rescued Maltese dog Chicklet shares a lot of the DNA as gray wolves. It's not exactly clear how the first wolves were domesticated. There are two theories on how this occurred. Most scientists agree that dogs were wild until approximately 12,000 years ago before the advent of agriculture. This would indicate that wolves were tamed by hunter-gatherer tribes. The first theory is that humans domesticated the wolves who would likely hang around the human camps in search of bones and leftover food. It's possible that docile wolves were slipped extra food scraps, or some people believe the hunters only tolerated the friendlier animals, driving away or killing the more dangerous wolves. According to this theory, the wolves may have split into two subspecies, the tamer one that associated with humans and a fiercer subspecies that remained wild. Another theory is that humans raised orphaned wolf cubs and later bred them. Over a period of many years living side by side with humans, these wolves gradually evolved into the first known dogs. Over time, they lost some of their ferocity and developed shorter muzzles and smaller teeth because there was no longer a need for these traits. Everyone wants a nice story about how wolves turned into man's best friend, and the truth is we don't know the exact circumstances. As of 2019, there were more than 340 different breeds of dogs. This is not evolution. This is the purposeful, selective breeding of dogs by humans. And it's been going on over the past 150 to 200 years. But here's what I want to focus on. Is there a price to be paid in the quest to create the perfect dog? Sure, humans have been interfering with the gene pool for a couple of hundred years in order to create the precise physical traits and temperaments they desire in dogs. But have we gone too far when it comes to breeding dogs that it's to the detriment of the dogs? There are so many dog lovers out there. I mean, really, who doesn't love dogs? Do you know anyone who dislikes dogs? Well, yeah, actually I do. I have a neighbor who hates dogs, and she hates people who have dogs. And isn't it funny how our dogs just know whose lawn to urinate on on our walks? Anyway, once humans are causing this harm to dogs by overbreeding them, whose job is it to say enough is enough? The breeders are not going to say enough is enough. This is their business to breed dogs. You and I care about this. You and I care about if we're harming dogs because we love dogs, all dogs. Breeders don't love all dogs. They say they do. Oh, I breed dogs because I love them. But they're hypocrites. Yep, even the responsible breeders, responsible breeder, that's an oxymoron. They don't love dogs. They know exactly how they are harming our dogs by their breeding practices. And if they truly love dogs, they wouldn't be harming them. More about breeders later. So, those who breed dogs would argue that they selectively breed in an effort to create purebred dogs with the most desirable physical and behavioral traits. However, I contend that it's the dogs that pay the price when humans influence genetics. Many purebred dogs end up with serious health problems, and certain breeds are genetically predisposed to develop diseases such as cancer, hip dysplasia, heart problems, and early onset of cataracts. I'll give you an example. The pug. You know what a pug looks like, right? Has a wrinkly face, velvety smooth coat, curled up tail, and this characteristic protruding lower jaw. And they're great dogs. Well, all dogs are great dogs. Our neighbors have pugs, and they refer to themselves as pug people, and have always owned pugs. 
purchase from breeders instead of rescuing them, unfortunately. And that's the only kind of dog they'll have. They have pug parties with other pug people, and it's cute, and it's fun for them, and that's fine. It's like their own little club. I've thought about crashing their pug party by bringing our pit bulls to say hello, but I didn't think they would appreciate that so much. So pugs are very cute. However, anyone considering getting a pug should know the health risks their dog could likely face in the future. Pugs are at risk for hip dysplasia as well as von Willebrand disease, which is a genetic bleeding disorder caused by low levels of clotting protein in the blood. Pugs also have a risk of getting pug dog encephalitis, also known as PDE, which is a fatal inflammatory brain disease that is unique to pugs. Pugs also have a higher incident of epilepsy, like getting seizures. Other health issues that can plague pugs are nerve degeneration and eye problems due to their large and prominent eyes. Short-nosed breeds, such as pugs, bulldogs, and French bulldogs, can have misshaped vertebrae, which in some cases leads to paralysis. These problems accompany the process of breeding dogs to a standard. And pugs are not alone. Many purebred dogs are unfortunately facing similar risks. The bulldog, English bulldog, the Cavalier King Charles Spaniel are all breeds considered high risk for congenital and hereditary problems that we, humans, breeders, have created for them. A study done by the University of California Davis Veterinary Medical Teaching Hospital delineated 10 inherited disorders that were more prevalent in purebred dogs as compared to their mixed breed counterparts. And these conditions are aortic stenosis, that's a serious problem and can be life-threatening, skin and allergy conditions, stomach dilation or bloat, vision problems, including cataracts, dilated cardiomyopathy, which is an enlargement of the chambers of the heart, another very serious condition, elbow dysplasia, epilepsy, hypothyroidism, problems with the discs between the vertebrae of the dog's spine, leading to neurological problems, and abnormal blood circulation whereby blood does not reach the liver. Not only are each of these ailments upsetting for pet owners to watch their pets suffer from, but many are so painful and debilitating to the dogs, and many are life-threatening. One pronounced example of a breed humans have loved and bred to death is the bulldog. Bulldogs, once the sturdy symbol of the British Empire, are known for making loving, docile pets, but they're also known for their many health problems. Their genetic predisposition to hip dysplasia, combined with their wide shoulders and low-slung bodies, makes mobility difficult for these dogs. Most bulldogs have severe breathing difficulties and have an increased risk of respiratory-related deaths. Most bulldogs also suffer from eye and ear issues, as well as allergic reactions. But the most obvious sign of how overbreeding has put the bulldog in danger of extinction is this. The breed cannot procreate on its own. The females must be artificially inseminated and the puppies must be delivered by cesarean section since their heads are far too big to pass through the birth canal. Insane! Look what we're doing to our dogs! Dogs make our lives so much better, don't they? How many times have you heard, oh, I don't know what I would do without my dog. He's saved my life. He or she is my best friend. All the studies showing the benefits to humans of having a dog. Decreased blood pressure, decreased risk of cardiovascular disease, pets lower stress levels, pets bring happiness to their guardians. Yes, we know all this. So this is a great way we're paying them back. Keep breeding them until we harm them. Stop hurting our dogs. Well, this certainly can't be happening with all purebred dogs, can it? Well, let's see. What's a dog everyone seems to love? Everyone stops to say hi to. The Golden Retriever. Perfect with families and children of all ages, described by the American Kennel Club as friendly, intelligent, and devoted. And this is why the Golden Retriever ranks third out of 195 breeds in popularity. Well, American Golden Retriever dog has paid a price for its popularity. This price comes in the form of a hereditary predisposition to a number of conditions and diseases. 
They have an increased risk for developing a number of types of cancer, including mast cell tumors and bone tumors. Aggressive blood vessel tumors have also been found at disproportionately high rates in these kinds of purebred dogs. Cataracts also. And as if this weren't enough to knowingly put a friendly, devoted dog at risk for, they are also prone to joint problems, ear infections, and skin conditions, and at least five different heart conditions. So why does this continue to occur? In most cases, this is the result of inbreeding. Inbreeding is the mating of dogs who are closely related to each other genetically. For example, just like with humans, the mating of cousins, siblings, or children with parents can result in dangerous genetic defects. The odds that a human newborn child who is the product of a brother-sister or father-daughter incest has about 50% chance of getting a severe birth defect or some mental deficiency. Same kind of genetic thing happens in the dog breeding world. You mate two dogs who are genetically closely related to each other, the dog's going to have some problems. So briefly, this is how it works. Most dog health conditions are caused by recessive genes. A recessive gene is a gene that can be masked or hidden by a dominant gene. In order to inherit a trait that is expressed by a recessive gene, for example, blue eyes, offspring must inherit that gene from both the mother and the father. Therefore, if one male dog sires too many litters, recessive genes will eventually pair up to create a trait when half-siblings and other descendants of that dog are mated. Here's a specific example. Two dogs from the same parents are brother and sister, regardless of whether they're from the same litter or different litters. So breeding those two dogs would be considered inbreeding. The mating of a grandmother with a grandson or a father with a daughter are other examples of the inbreeding that occurs today. This type of mating between close relatives has long been accepted as normal and even desirable in the dog breeding practice. Inbreeding has gone on in the pedigree dog world for decades to maintain the purity of bloodlines and increase the number of dogs of a breed displaying certain desirable characteristics. Inbreeding of dogs from a relatively small gene pool is how the most desirable characteristics of most modern breeds of pedigree dogs came to exist. So we know that dogs with certain traits have worked alongside humans for centuries. However, most modern dog breeds and most genetic health problems have developed over the past couple of hundred years as dog shows gain popularity. Organizations such as the American Kennel Club, AKC, which was founded in 1884, have set the breed standards or standards defining what each breed should look like. The AKC advertises itself as, quote, the recognized and trusted expert in breed, health, and training information for dogs. It's also the largest registry of purebred dogs in the United States, and it's the only not-for-profit registry, as well as the most well-known and the most influential. However, it's just that, a registry. So, if the AKC simply keeps the registry of breeds and sets the breed standard, how are they to blame for so many genetic illnesses that are clearly the result of hundreds of years of breeding dogs for desired traits? In its mission statement, the AKC clearly states that it is, quote, dedicated to upholding the integrity of its registry, promoting the sport of purebred dogs, and breeding for type and function. They have done this by encouraging people to buy from breeders and even giving money to actively combat spay and neuter campaigns. It also claims in its mission, quote, to advance canine health and well-being, work to protect the rights of all dog owners, and promote responsible dog ownership. Yet while the organization claims to be all about the health of dogs, the AKC has come under fire for the prevalence of genetic disorders in purebred dogs. According to the People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals, the true objective of the American Kennel Club is to study, exhibit, promote, and maintain dog breeds regardless of the cost to the dogs or to society. You may have heard that when people are not wanting to adopt from a shelter or a rescue group and they're determined to buy a dog from a breeder, they might be advised to find a, quote, reputable breeder. What people often consider reputable is an AKC-registered breeder. 
Does that mean the breeder's dogs are healthy? Not necessarily. What it means is that the breeder has paid fees to belong to the American Kennel Club. This means that the puppies purchased from an AKC breeder come with papers that essentially certify both parents are of the same breed. In fact, a 2013 investigation that was reported on in Today News found that even though the AKC is supposed to be inspecting its registered breeders and breeding facilities to ensure proper care and conditions, some AKC breeders were found to be raising sick puppies in filthy conditions. In order to achieve the so-called perfect desired appearance and temperament, the AKC promotes the continued breeding of closely related dogs. I'm going to say that again. In order to achieve the so-called perfect desired appearance and temperament of a dog, the AKC promotes the continued breeding of closely related dogs. Dogs don't care what they look like. I've known three-legged dogs, one-eyed dogs, a dog who's had his face and head set on fire, scarred-up dogs. They don't care about their appearance. They just want to love someone. They'll love their humans regardless. They do care, and their human guardians do care, if they're suffering from a genetic disease or condition which affects their health and their lifespan. But if they're commodities sold to make a profit, if they're considered a business's bottom line, they must conform to the standard. And if they don't, they won't sell. James Serpell, professor of ethics and animal welfare and director of the Center for the Interaction of Animals and Society at the University of Pennsylvania School of Veterinary Medicine, explains that a breeder's primary concern was to produce dogs that look like the breed standard. He states, even if they, meaning the breeders, did recognize health problems, Breeders were too driven to produce what was perceived to be the most perfect breed. So I would ask breeders whether they feel any moral or ethical obligation whatsoever to these dogs to do the right thing. Do you care about animals or do you just care about animals as long as they're bringing in a profit? And I'm not talking about the backyard breeders, a term which refers to unlicensed amateur breeders. I'm talking about state licensed, reputable breeders who know what they're doing, who know the science and genetics behind mating dogs. Thomas Famula is an animal breeding specialist at the University of California, Davis, who has focused his research on the inheritance of disease in dogs. He points to the fact that consumers will look to the breed standard when choosing a dog as a pet because there's certainty in what they will get. He says they know what the dog will look like and how it will act. However, he too ultimately thinks the responsibility To look out for the dog's health falls on the dog breeders, since they're the ones making the decisions about which dogs they're breeding. Still, others believe the responsibility for change rests with the buyers. And it does, as long as people are willing to pay exorbitant amounts of money for cute puppies without concern for how the dog's health has been impacted, nothing will change. Many people believe that buying a dog from a breeder They are getting a superior pet, a dog that is guaranteed to be healthy, social, and friendly. This is a myth. It's a myth that purebreds are superior or better dogs than mixed breed dogs. And there's no such guarantee that comes with the puppy you buy from a breeder. Although it's in the best interest of the breeder to keep this myth alive and well, because ultimately a breeder is running a business. But consumers are driving the market for these dogs. We, the public, need to put an end to the consumer demand for their product because it's the demand for perfect, purebred dogs which has concentrated these bad recessive genes, which I explained about earlier, which resulted in the more than 500 genetic defects which exist in today's purebred dogs. Okay, so there's no way I can talk for 30 minutes about purebred dogs without talking about puppy mills. Puppy mills, also known as puppy farms, are commercial dog breeding facilities that are generally inhumane, overcrowded, dirty, disgusting, cruel facilities that produce sick and diseased animals that largely end up in pet stores or are sold online or at flea markets. 
Puppy mills are where millions of dogs suffer needlessly for the purpose of creating purebreds. And although the general public is starting to learn not to buy animals from pet stores or online, the fact remains that approximately 10,000 of them are still operating in the United States, producing millions of puppies every year. So we need to continue educating people about the truth and cruelty inherent in puppy mills. And puppy mills still exist because there's still a demand for purebred puppies. People are willing to pay very high prices for dogs whom they believe are more valuable. And this has resulted in a multi-billion dollar industry. Now, are puppy mills the same thing as breeders? No, they're not. Puppy mills mass produce puppies who are kept captive in small cages and living in cruel and unhealthy conditions. But puppy mills are not going to call themselves puppy mills. They're going to call themselves breeders. So how does one know if they're dealing with a puppy mill or a breeder? Well, I'll put it this way. You're not likely to see a puppy mill. But listen, at the end of the day, puppy mills and breeders are businesses and they're selling the same product. And private breeders can say they love dogs and they might genuinely love the animals they breed and they care for, but we all know that they're in the business to sell dogs and make a profit. And you know what? If breeders truly love dogs in the normal sense of the word, they would not be creating more of them, many of which end up in the shelters at some point in the animal's life and burdening the system. Instead, they would be working with shelters and rescue groups to save dogs. I think we, as a society, are much too easy on the breeders who themselves accept no responsibility of having to do with not only the health problems in purebred dogs, but the pet overpopulation problem as well. With numerous animal shelters filled to capacity, the one thing you can guarantee if you buy a puppy from a breeder is that one more dog stays in an overcrowded shelter, sleeps on a cement kennel floor, and if it's lucky, waits one more day for a loving home. Each puppy purchased from a breeder means one less dog gets adopted or saved from a shelter. And remember, there's still approximately 1.2 million dogs euthanized in shelters each year due to overcrowding, lack of space, and a shortage of loving adopters. No matter how much one loves a certain breed, it's simply irresponsible on so many levels to produce more animals until all shelter animals have loving homes. And I'm not afraid to criticize breeders. And whenever I can, I encourage people who want to get dogs, even purebreds, not to support the breeding industry and instead go to a shelter or rescue group. Shelters are filled with mixed breed dogs, but they're also filled with purebred dogs in need of loving homes. You can find any breed you're looking for in a local shelter or at a breed rescue group. Not only will the same breed cost you less from a shelter or a rescue group, but the adoption fee will also likely cover spaying and neutering and shots and microchipping, and you'll be saving a life. There is a pet overpopulation problem, and no matter how qualified or well-meaning a breeder may be, there's no justification for creating more animals for profit. Here are some things you can do to help. Educate your friends about dog breeding. Get your next dog or puppy from a local shelter or breed rescue group. And if you don't find the right match for you, keep checking back. Shelters get new dogs and puppies in all the time. Encourage people in the market for a pet to adopt from a shelter or a rescue group and not to buy from a breeder. Research the health issues that certain purebred dogs are prone to developing. And share this episode of Animals Today on your social media and with your friends. And if you enjoy our program, please consider making a donation to Advancing the Interests of Animals at AIAnimals.org. That's AIAnimals.org.